Yeah. Yeah. Th thank you all for being here. Our beautiful Sugar Hill development has proven the power a neighborhood has to chart a new path in affordable housing and early education and to preserve its history by creating the cornerstone of civility with a museum of art and storytelling for children. Children are all communities' most precious treasure, and this building has, be, has been designed to center on children and their families. They will thrive from the public and private investment we have woven together on 155th Street, thanks to all of you. It has truly been a collective effort. The story begins with a woman named Susan Halpern, president of the Cyrus Fund, who believes in social justice for children. It is so good to see her seated with some of the families expecting to become tenants at Sugar Hill. Susan's gift moved BHC into action to secure financing from every level of government led by the City of New York with major support from the State of New York and the private and philanthropic sector. Mayor de Blasio, we are honored you have joined us this morning knowing you are a champion of affordable housing and high quality early education. We share your vision for our city enthusiastically. Council Speaker Melissa Mark Vivierto, you visited BHC before you became speaker, and we know you understand bettering our community takes both pragmatic and progressive steps forward. Comptroller Scott Stringer, your support of this project has been ongoing, and we are proud to guarantee the cost benefits of nonprofit sponsored housing, education, and the arts. Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, you are a longtime friend of progressive community action. Thank you for being here. Councilman Idanis Rodriguez, your dedication, your values, and your commitment to community uplift everyone. We count on you to move government forward. Former Council Member Robert Jackson, the Sugar Hill development would simply not have been feasible without your leadership to provide capital support. We will forever be grateful to you. Vicki Bean, Commissioner of HPD. HPD is at the core of all seven of BHC's housing developments and has had set a new standard on Sugar Hill. Tom Finkelpearl, Commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs, thank you for your commitment that art is for everyone. There are nine New York City agencies involved with this effort, and I cannot name them all, but our neighbors, the Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, deserve special credit. Deputy Commissioner Jim Roberts, who grew up in this neighborhood, together with the help of Ed Coleman and Rick Nelson and all the DEP staff next door have made possible the, our entrance plaza through an easement agreement and it accommodated the many and noisy burdens of a construction site. I want to thank my, express my deepest appreciation to SLCE Architects, our architect of record, Saki Yakis and Fernando Alvarez, and our design architectural team, uh, David Ajay and Mark McQuaid. Richmond Housing Sources, Bill Trailer, we've made it thanks to you. Capital One Bank, you led the financing of this project at multiple levels. The Housing Tax Credit Program, thanks to Congressman Rangel. The New Market Tax Credit Program, thanks to Congressman Rangel. The Construction Loan, as well. Capital One Bank is the lead investor in this development. Corporation for Supportive Housing, Brownfields, and Capital One again are our new market investors. Mount Co Construction. 
is Sugar Hill's builder. Joel Mounty and his team are exceptional, and Tom Sinclair, in particular, is the man who gets all this work done. Hudson Meridian is the museum's builder, and everyone must return to see their very fine work completed. As you all know, new buildings leak a lot. Mm -hmm. We're not done yet. Mm. <laughs> My thanks to every member of BHC's board of directors, many of whom are here, the chair, John Felice, and with special appreciation to Alan Weil of the firm of Sidley Austin and Valerie Campbell from Kramer Levin for their pro bono legal support. BHC's staff are the very best. Marianne Villari deserves extra credit. She, she has protected us over and past all the hurdles in the journey to create Sugar Hill. Charlene Melville will lead our educational agenda. We must thank Ophelia Rodriguez. Ophelia and all the artists who strengthen our community. We welcome No Longer Empties exhibition this summer as tenants are moving in, teachers are preparing for the arrival of young students, and the museum is completed. Sugar Hill truly reflects what BHC has learned over the past 30 years, that permanent, dignified, affordable housing, along with community-based programs in education and the arts, are the foundation for creating vibrant communities. In addition to providing a new landmark of pride and promise for Northern Manhattan, we see Sugar Hill as an innovative model for future projects across our city. We know that the need could not be more urgent. New York ranks 24th in the nation in early childhood funding, and we received nearly 50,000 applications for the apartments at Sugar Hill. We especially cannot forget the seniors and all the families who applied to Sugar Hill and were found ineligible because they are under income. This is why we're so proud to have a mayor who shares our vision and commitment and is a true partner and leader in tackling this enormous challenge. I now have the honor and privilege of introducing a great advocate for all New Yorkers. He works hard every day to make sure that every New Yorker has a safe, affordable place to live and to guarantee that every child has access to equal quality education. He is doing so much for our neighborhood and for our city. The mayor of New York, Mayor Bill de Blasio. Thank you. I'm thrilled so many people are here today to be a part of this extraordinary celebration. This is really a moment of tremendous progress for this neighborhood and for this city. Ellen, you did a great job of naming all of your colleagues who are playing a crucial role in this extraordinary development, truly extraordinary. This is visionary. This is the way it should be. Everyone who Ellen named is a crucial part of it. We thank them. I think we have to thank Ellen for her leadership, her vision. And as Ellen is the first to attest, it takes a village. And you may name some of the people uh, from government and from uh, federal, state, city government who have been involved. Two of the people will be a big part of making this work going forward are our commissioners, our HPD commissioner, Vicki Bean, our cultural affairs commissioner, Tom Finkelpearl. Let's thank both of them for what they do. I'm going to introduce my colleagues along the way, so I won't acknowledge up front. I'll, I'll acknowledge when I introduce each one. Look, this is an extraordinary day for Harlem. It's an extraordinary day for Sugar Hill. Sugar Hill is those two words are part of our heart and soul as New Yorkers. They capture the imagination. They mean a lot. They evoke 
the Harlem Renaissance. They evoked, evoke incredible figures like Langston Hughes and W.E.B. Du Bois and Zora Neale Hurston. They speak to this community as a powerful cultural center, not just for New York City, but for the entire nation. And they talk also, by definition, these words signify a new strength, a rebirth, a new direction, an ever more exciting set of possibilities for this community as a pivot of New York City. And this development we're in, this building, is in a sense an epitome of so many of the things that we believe in and want to do. If you think about our efforts to create affordable housing and to create affordable housing that reaches across the income spectrum in terms of the needs of people, including some of our lowest income New Yorkers. This is something Vicki Bean is leading the way on, our plan to create 200,000 units. Let's look at these numbers, 124 permanently affordable units for low-income families, 25 set aside for formerly homeless individuals. Affordable units even for folks at the lowest income level. A family of five making $28,000. $28,000 can live in a three-bedroom here for a little over $500 a month. That's extraordinary. And this was done on a brownfield site that had been given up on. It's an example of rejuvenation, renewal, entrepreneurship, community involvement, community leadership. We get the affordable housing. We also get this extraordinary early childhood center, which is going to be a part of our pre-K plan starting this September. So the vision here was so comprehensive in terms of needs of the community because the community was involved in the planning process, something we believe in thoroughly. We're going to have an early childhood center serving as many as 120 children, three pre-K classrooms, 54 pre-K seats starting this September, already approved as part of our pre-K plan. The building's beautiful. The building does so many things. You're going to hear from David Ajay in a moment, the architect who did an extraordinary job and really thoughtfully thought about how the building serves the whole community. It also, this excites me, I know Tom Finkelpearl feels this too, 17,000 square foot Sugar Hill Children's Museum of Art and Storytelling. I love that. Now, I will say I come from a family of storytellers. Uh, you know your Italian history people who come from the area of Naples are known as the storytellers of Italy, and I use my hands a lot, as you might have noticed. The storytelling tradition is part of what makes New York City so extraordinary. We are a city of storytellers, but we haven't celebrated it in quite the way that it will be done here. This, to me, is an extraordinary moment to deepen our understanding of who we are as New Yorkers and have a museum which focuses not just on art but on storytelling and teaches our children about this extraordinary oral tradition that is at the core of who we are. So this is an amazing, amazing moment. Uh, I want to give you a quote that really identifies why this is such a success, why it became so inclusive of the needs of the community. Jane Jacobs, one of the great urbanists of all time, said, cities have the capability of providing something for everybody, but only when they are created by everybody. Here, you had Broadway housing communities involving all of the people of the community who cared to participate to think about what would really work. It's no surprise that you get affordable housing, pre-K center, and a cultural space because the community said that's what the community needs. And this is an example where we need to go in this city. So this is a great, great day for New York City. And now I'd like to introduce my partner in city government, a woman who makes so much of what we do work. If I can get the step to come out. Come on, step. Just one second, please. OK, I want to say to my team, we need to oil the step. <laughs> we, are, we are having step malfunction. Now it's out. Thank you very much, Robert Jackson, for stepping up to the step. And now, the Speaker of the New York City Council, Melissa Mark Viverito. Good morning. Good morning. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. It's um, really quite an awesome day here today. 
Uh, I see so many people probably that are not only press, but community residents, those that have been true partners with this wonderful institution to help get us to this day. Uh, I want to recognize uh, my colleague Idani Rodriguez, and I know our former council member Robert Jackson, who was instrumental in the council. I know he was one of the main uh, promo promo promoters of this project always coming knocking on our doors, asking for capital support. Uh, but the council as a whole in partnership as well uh, is really proud that we have been able to contribute to this moment in time. So I really wanna thank everyone for joining us here to celebrate in our city's commitment to making this city affordable for all New Yorkers. Uh, today, we're on site of the soon to be completed Sugar Hill Apartments thanks to the hard work and commitment to progressive values exhibited by Broadway housing community under the leadership of Ellen Baxter and all the partners that are here today. In this difficult economy, more and more New Yorkers are being priced out of their longtime homes and neighborhoods. We all know that a safe place to call home is the bedrock for building opportunity and getting ahead. But for too many middle class and working families, this basic assurance of housing security is under constant and growing threat. So that's why, as a city, we have committed to preserving and creating more opportunities for quality, affordable, and supportive housing for all New Yorkers. And the Sugar Hill Apartments we're announcing today represent a huge step forward toward that goal. And it really is kind of epitomizes what we really look forward to seeing happen moving forward as a progressive city and as a city that is really inclusive of all. So this is really an incredible moment. The Sugar Hill Apartments, as we've heard, uh, bring together core institutions proven to hold the keys to greater opportunity and success. Housing, education, and cultural development. The Sugar Hill Apartments will provide 124 families with a place to call home, including 25 units set aside for homeless New Yorkers, which is, again, we're seeing those numbers rise. Uh, the no overall homeless population, unfortunately, but also the, growing, the growth of homelessness among our vets, and that's just not acceptable. Every apartment in the Sugar Hill development will remain permanently affordable, critically important, so these apartments can contribute long-term to a diverse, vibrant community. And as we've heard about the museum preschool, which is an integral and very exciting part of this project, which will ensure that 100 young children will have access to equality early childhood education, including three pre-kindergarten classrooms serving 54 four-year-olds. So that's a great part of the vision that our mayor has laid out. It's really exciting. These classrooms will jumpstart an early appreciation for learning in all its forms for our youngest New Yorkers. And lastly, the cornerstone of the Sugar Hill development, the Children's Museum of Art and Storytelling. In a city that thrives as a hub for innovation and art, it's essential that our children experience the, cool, the full cultural fabric that makes New York so exceptional. And the unique museum in a school program structure of Sugar Hill Preschool will allow them to do just that. So I wanna thank everyone who made this project possible, Broadway Housing Communities, Mayor Bill de Blasio, HPD, uh, the city council, all the community partners and local elected officials. Today is a great day for Sugar Hill, and I'm looking forward to seeing all the families move in later this summer. So thank you all very much. <laughs> Another crucial partner in all we do in the city government, my friend, Comptroller Scott Stringer. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ma Mr. Mayor and Ellen and everybody who is bringing this project to fruition. I just want to come by today, not just because as borough president I helped uh, fund some of this with uh, tax dollars, but people who grew up as I did in northern Manhattan, I think, appreciate this project more than most because when we were growing up, there was no, no such thing as economic development. Banks did not want to invest uptown. Uh, nobody thought that anyone would invest uptown. People were more greedy and speculative than they were about building community. And I see some nods from people in the audience. Uh, the reality is that back then, banks were redlining and didn't want to invest money. So much has changed that today we have a template and a model for the mayor's affordable housing plan. It's no accident he's here, and we should give him a big round of applause because he's. 
He's making a statement today that this is how you build communities. First, you build affordable housing. Then you surround that affordable housing with cultural opportunity. And then you make sure children have daycare and they're safe. Edonis Rodriguez and I have something in common. I have a two and a half year old. He has a 15 month old. I have a one year old. We will tell you that no matter where you live, the point when your child is born, the first thing you think about is where can that child be safe? Where can that child have daycare where that child can learn and grow and a parent can go to work? Right here in Sugar Hill, we've hit all three. And this must be the model beyond Manhattan and throughout our city. So I congratulate the architect, the people who understood very clearly that the way you build a community is by these three components. And as we go through the city affordable housing plan, this is what New York really has an opportunity to look like. And for communities that never had investment, that never had banks, that never had people who wanted to invest from the ground up, this is the day that Northern Manhattan changed because we brought people together to change the way we we'll view communities. Thank you all and congratulations to everybody. Thank you. We appreciate anyone who helps to make these kind of projects happen. We especially appreciate when someone helps us get federal dollars, which are more scarce than they should be for affordable housing, not just in New York City, but all over the country, a bigger issue we have to confront going forward. We want to thank Congressman Rangel for helping to get resources for this project. Welcome him to speak. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On this rainy, stormy morning, we thank you for bringing this beacon, Mr. Mayor, this beacon of sunshine, uh, okay, to, to Sugar Hill. When I was a kid, Sugar Hill was more than just a community. Those of us who lived in the so-called valley on Lenox Avenue, we would look up to the great city college and all the great buildings, and we knew that that's where those people that did not have economic problems, but were poets and musicians and uh, educators, and we looked up to one day being a part of the Hill. I am so appreciative of the so many different people and agencies and departments that have come together to make this Hill, this Sugar Hill, a mecca of all of the wonderful things that make up our country, and especially our city. Mayor Dinkins used to call us the gorgeous mosaic meaning that we have taken people from all different countries, all different colors, all different cultures, music, food, and brought them together in our great city. And I cannot think of any part of this city that I was grown and raised in that is more symbolic of what an attraction the heartbeat of New York and the United States have been to so many different peoples from so many different cultures. And so as we are here today, I am so glad that the empowerment zone played a role in this, the new market tax credit did, and just as the low income tax credit changed the housing so dramatically in upper Manhattan, we do hope that now we recognize it is affordable housing, affordable housing, affordable housing that we face as a crisis. And this is a classic example of how we don't have to talk about any 80-20. We can talk about people who work hard each and every day and deserve a place to live and to raise their children. So congratulations to the whole team, private sector, public sector, this is a historic moment for our great city, and I'm glad it's happening in Upper Manhattan. Thank you very much, Congressman. I want to now welcome a man who deserves so much credit for the design uh, that is so exciting, and, and he hails from Ghana. And my wife and I have a particular affection for his home nation, having visited several times, and we know uh, there are so many wonderful things happening in Ghana. I'm glad one of those wonderful things happened here, and you've come to join us, David Ajay. <laughs> 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 
thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here today to talk to you about this extraordinary project. As an architect, we, um, we learn about these kinds of projects, but it's so rare that we see a city doing this kind of project. And so we're thrilled to be part of this innovative, what we believe is a groundbreaking project, which will be studied, um, I know already, by many students around the world who are interested in looking at this model. Um, it, it, we, you know, when meeting Ellen, we were completely moved by her vision to do something that seems so obvious but is so lacking and so required. So I'm thrilled to be part of this. This project is inspired by this great community and this great history and legacy. It's inspired by the great historic architecture of Harlem, and, um, and I hope you're going to enjoy it. We're going to take the tours later, and I will, I will go into detail about the building at that point. Thank you very much. I think given your talent and your brevity, you should get more projects in New York City to work on. Now, good friend who has fought very hard for affordable housing, the borough president of Manhattan, Gail Brewer. Thank you very much. Um, when I was in the city council, I was co-chair of the Manhattan delegation, and we did allocate money to this project. I want to thank Robert Jackson. If he mentioned Sugar Hill one more time, we were going to kill him. <laughs> And, but to his credit, he pushed really hard, and I want you to know that he was relentless and it was worth it. The second issue is the uh, mayor talked about Jane Jacobs, and it's a wonderful tribute to her, but uh, I went to some graduations this weekend, and people from the 1964 class introduced to 2014, and they talked about rotary phones, and they talked about you know, horrible assassinations in 1964. And then I say in 50 years, because guess what, it's going to be a long time, but we're going to be talking about Ellen Baxter, and people are going to be quoting her as the next Jane Jacobs. <laughs> and I say that because it's not just Sugar Hill. Every project that's done um, by her and uh, her organization has a community aspect. I go to her buildings, and we have weddings in there, we have bar mitzvahs in there, we have uh, bridal showers, etc. The whole c community is involved in every single building she does. So I'm here to not repeat and talk about all the great things, except to say this is going to be the museum. I want to thank Susie DeValio for that, because this museum was also part <laughs> of the discussion and the funding. So between the culture, the pre-K, the early education, and the housing, thank you, Ellen Baxter. And I'll be a broken record always on the question of affordable housing. We need help from the state of New York, uh, always going to push for more resources so we can house our people, someone who's been fighting for us in Albany, not a fun and easy place to fight in, but has been fighting for us is State Senator Adriano Espaillat. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Sugar Hill, you know, I grew up in Washington Heights, right there on 153rd Street. I always wonder whether it was Washington Heights or Sugar Hill, but uh, Sugar Hill always imposed itself on us. And uh, Ellen Baxter is a visionary. And what she's done here in Northern Manhattan, I think was best highlighted by the New York Times uh, Sunday Magazine in a spread that, that really put out her vision. You know, she took the Rio Hotel, which was like a, an eyesore, on Fort Washington Avenue, and she turned it into a gem. And I remember, because I was a community board member back then. And then she went to 135th Street, and she did a fantastic job. But this one, you've outdone yourself with this one. And uh, the one part that I really like um, is how she integrates uh, the art uh, with housing, and you know, you almost, uh, uh, I know the, the one on 135th Street and Riverside, when you walk in, you almost feel like you're walking into a cathedral, you know, because it's, it's got these beautiful murals, and of course a nice rooftop uh, garden, and, and she's done a wonderful job. Ophelia is on the ground with her, they're a tag team. Where's Ophelia? <laughs> Ophelia, give a round of applause for Ophelia. She does great work for the community, and so, She's in the back, of course, uh, being humble and uh, unassuming, but she is a, a, a rock. And so congratulations both, the team that put this together, the funding, all the sources that it came from. This is the kind of model we need in New York City and in this neighborhood. A neighborhood is scrapped for affordable housing. 50,000 people applied for this 
uh, space here. Imagine that, Mayor. Your plan is uh, well focused to bring 200,000 units to the city. We need them. We really need them. We need to make sure we keep New Yorkers here. Thank you so much. Congratulations, <laughs> Ellen. Okay. I want to bring up a couple of more of my uh, elected colleagues before we open up. We will do uh, on-topic questions first, and then we'll do off-topic after. But next, let me first acknowledge, I, I failed to acknowledge earlier, uh, there's many great professionals who have contributed vital uh, elements to this project. Uh, the architect, Saki Yakas, has played a crucial role. I want to thank him for his efforts. Let's give him a round of applause. Now, a guy I have worked with since I first had the honor of being involved in New York City government, he will not need the step. <laughs> Assembly member, Herman Denny Farrell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was trying to figure out what, whether I should kick it up or just stand on it. But it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, everybody's talking about Sugar Hill. I lived two blocks to our north in 1940. I went across the street to school, which was PS 46. I lived on Sugar Hill, and I didn't know, Charlie, that uh, we were the elite. <laughs> I, nobody ever told me that. You never lived in the valley. No, I was always, ru <laughs> I was always running from your, my friends in the valley. <laughs> For those of us, <laughs> we had prettier girls than they did. <laughs> No, so it's really a pleasure to be here to see this building going in. And one of the great things in life is having to cross the street when you're seven years old. And in those days, we didn't uh, have nannies picking you up. So when I went to school across the street there, 146th Street, uh, PS 46, I had to come down this way because I had a nanny, if you, is what you'd call her now, a woman who took care of me at 79 St. Nicholas Place. Now, to get across that street, you could take the subway to cross over, but you couldn't cross over here because this was a garage with three doors on it. So cars were always popping in and out of it. So you had to cross over the subway, then walk, then come down along the park, and then make a right turn and hope you could get across that street at the age of seven, I think I was doing that. So I'm glad when I heard this building was going and this new building was coming, I said, good, it'll be safe for all the children that do live down here. It's little things like that you think about when you get old. Uh, but it's a pleasure to be here because this is what we need throughout this area. We have a lot of spaces here. We've got to be careful because right now everybody's trying to build hotels. So we've got to be sure, Mr. Mayor, that we don't lose spaces to them because um, I noticed the, the, the Rio Hotel, which is on 160th Street and, say, and, and Fort Washington Avenue, there's a building next to it. All of a sudden, that building has become an apartment house. I don't know how that happened, but they're saying rooms available now. So I think it's one of these new hotels that are sneaking in, and I'm gonna be calling to check to make sure it's real and not legal and not something just decided. But those are the problems we're going to have. And if we're going to keep this community a, a very live and vibrant community, we want to make sure we have people who are going to live and stay here. And we don't need transients. So we will be fighting to make sure we don't get any hotels, but we get places like this that work for our people, for everyone. So thank you very much for what you've done. And I've got some things for you to do in the future. Thank you very much. In the city council, we have many great members, and one who's been a particularly fierce advocate for affordable housing, and a particularly strong uh, supporter of our affordable housing plan, council member Idanis Rodriguez. Well, you know, I'm standing uh, close to the mayor and the leader, and you know, it's amazing. As a council member that I was there for four years, now, every day, I enjoy being part of the progressive elected official in your city, a, a progressive leaders who believe in this vision, 
Helen, I think this provides opportunity to the wealthy New Yorkers to be associated with this type of project. I think that we can build a formula, support the major vision for affordable housing, and tell all the wealthy New Yorkers, identify a way of how you can put some of your money, hope to build affordable housing. This is a model. Uh, Senator Espaillat, he is mentioning one of the buildings that Helen took at 135th and, and Riverside Drive. I, inv I invite the media to go and look to that model because it's working already. It's a matter where we have homeless people living there and they are treated with respect. And the children of those families, they are doing good at school because they believe in those children. When you walk into the building, you see all those art exhibitions in the entry of that building. And that's what you will see in this particular place. This is not a play that only we will have a, a number of, of, of tenants coming from the homeless shelters and be able to live their life and share their life and be treated with respect. But the children, they will be getting a top early quality education. And that's what we need. And that's what we'll be able to build the middle class in New York City. If we invest and we follow the vision of the mayor saying we need to invest more. So for me, this is a new day. You know, my district go from 228, but it ended here at 155 in, in the Harvest Park. I could name in that street, Willie Mays. And I think that uh, providing Willie Mays the opportunity when we invite him to come to that ceremony and say, uh, you are a role model to our young people. Here in your neighborhood, we have a building where people coming from a shirt, the working class and middle class, they can live together. So again, Para mí es una oportunidad de que apoyemos al alcalde, de que invitemos a la clase de poder económico a que inviertan en proyectos como esto. We have land. We have 35 acres at the MTA at 207. So and I know that if we are able to get the federal funding to build a platform in those 35 acres, there's a great potential to continue reproducing models of this one. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, the mayor and the speaker in Manhattan World President. Finally, a uh, man who I had the honor of serving with in the city council, and I know he had his heart and soul in this project, and I bet it feels like a, a end of a long, good journey, Robert. So we welcome former council member Robert Jackson. Well, Mayor, City Controller, State Senator, City Council, State Assembly, Architects, Congress Member, I'm telling you, we have the formula in order to make sure that the funding is there for 200,000 units of affordable housing in New York City. Do you agree? Do you agree? Do you agree? I think so. And let me just, I'm gonna tell you a story. This goes back about four years ago, something like that. Uh, I got a call from Luis Miranda, who is a, who is a consultant for Broadway Housing. Um, and he said they wanted to meet with me because this was my district. And I said, okay, so we met down there and Ellen was there and they said they needed about $6 million in government funding. And after listening to them, I said, absolutely, I will be a partner in that. And so I, I promised and committed uh, $2 million of my capital, allo ex capital allocation for this project. And as Gail and Melissa knows, I advocated for them in a Manhattan delegation with the Speaker's office to make sure that happened. And so in total, the City Council gave $3 million for this project. And I also said to them, you know, you have a State Assembly member, you have a State Senator, you have a Borough President, you have a Congress, go after them for the rest of the money. Because totally, it's working together in order to get it done. And that's really what it's about. And so I just want to say a, a few words about how important it is. I, when I speak, I speak about Broadway housing communities and the type of projects that Ellen and her staff have put together. It is the vision of the future and is now. And all you have to do is go to the, to the other projects that were mentioned and you will see what I'm talking about. You gotta see for yourself. And in fact, in talking to Ellen, uh, she said that the other projects were rehabs, but this is the first from the ground up. And let me tell you, this is a beautiful project. 
affordable housing. We're talking about low and moderate income housing. And in fact, before the ceremony started, I was speaking to several individuals here who are applicants uh, for these apartments here. Young families, adult individuals, you know, seeking the type of dream that they're looking for. And you know, I just applaud all of you for applying because the first step is to apply. And as I said to you, you have to be in it to win it. And you were in it. And hopefully, you've won it. But also, uh, uh, what's very important, as someone said, this is not 50-50. It's not 80-20. This is 100% low and moderate income housing. So 100%. <laughs> and I was one of several honorees the other day at the Leroy Neiman Arts Center on Frederick Douglass Boulevard, which is, if you don't know, that's 8th Avenue. And I talked about Broadway housing. And I talked about any uh, project or any housing unit you walk in, you see the type of artwork all over the place. And so here, as Ellen and others said, 124 units of low and moderate income housing. A daycare center that's going to look out onto the park. Look right out there on 155th Street across to the park. 120 slots a children's museum storytelling. In fact, you're sitting right in it. You're sitting right in it. And also a roof garden where they're going to be growing their own food. So it's very, very important to say that I could not have been involved with this project myself, Ellen. The staff, as you know, you know, we don't need to give the whole history, Robert. My, let, <laughs> let me tell you, Mr. Mayor, this has to be said. As you know, the importance of staff. And so let me just tell you, I have staff here that were very, very much involved that helped me move in that direction. And so you have Joanna Garcia, Elizabeth Payano, you have Hayel Sanchez, and even Martin Smith, who now works for the state senator. But Ellen, on behalf of everyone here, and especially the, uh, the people that's going to be the residents in this development, I want to give you a big hug. Thank you. We have had an unusually long program. We're about to go first to on-topic questions, then to off-topic questions from the media. I know a number of my colleagues have very tight schedules and places have to be, so anyone who has to leave at this moment is a good time. We understand your schedules. Let's go now to our friends in the media for on-topic questions on this development and all the pieces of it first. Anything about, and uh, Vicki and uh, Ellen, I may call upon to help me if I don't know the answer. So media questions on topic. On, yes, on. Affordable housing, pre-K, cultural, yes. Now, right there. How did you make the housing permanently affordable here? Okay, Vicki Vicky and Ellen, come forward. <laughs> Wait, back. There we go. How do we make it permanently affordable? So that's really a tribute to Ellen and her team, but it's, it's a move that you know, we're very much hoping to go to in a wider range of developments. Um, but uh, the, the way that the financing is structured between tax credits and, and as we heard, uh, $3 million from the city council, money from home, our home dollars from, uh, from uh, HPD, from the federal home dollars. So it all came together to allow us to, uh, and, and because of Ellen's uh, incredible nonprofit mission, it allowed us to set them aside as permanently affordable. Okay, media, yes. You're, you're, you're in the non-media area. You're confusing me, brother. Okay. Oh, I'm, I'll start, and Vicki, feel free to jump in. Now look, this, the whole concept of 200,000 units over 10 years is based on using a wide variety of tools. If you look at the plan that we published on May 1st, or around May 1st, it involves some pieces that federal support is crucial, state support is crucial, some that's based on rezonings, some that's based on nonprofits, a whole range of pieces. We said very clearly in that proposal, Permanent affordability is the goal. That will not always be the case. A lot of affordable housing is built 
for example, typically 30-year time frame, and we need a lot of that right now. But where we can get permanent, where the specific financing is available and the specific partnership is available to get permanent, it's obviously our preference. But I think the th way to think about the affordable housing plan is a lot of individual transactions that add up, if we do enough of them fast enough, add up to the 200,000 units either built or preserved. Anything to add? Good. Okay. Yes. There was a hearing on your affordable housing plan schedule for June 12th from the city council and it's been postponed. Can you comment on that and do you know if there's a new date for, for the hearing? I don't know the uh, specifics of the council uh, scheduling process. Obviously, we look forward, to, we've already had a lot of dialogue with council members about the plan uh, and we're very happy to participate in a hearing whenever they deem it appropriate. Again, I don't, don't tend to get involved in the intricacies of the council scheduling process, but I think whenever they feel ready and whenever you know, they've agreed with our folks, it's time to make the presentation and answer the questions, we'll be ready. On topic, on topic. Media back there? Okay. Uh, how does architecture and design play a larger role in your process? Well, I think a uh, couple of points. I mean, clearly, we want uh, the buildings that are created to be beautiful and obviously contextually appropriate to their neighborhoods. There's a lot that we care about aesthetically, and Vicki will be a part of that thinking. Carl Weiss brought as our city planning chair and the whole city planning commission. Sometimes we'll ask Tom Finkelpearl for advice. Aesthetic, great man, Tom Finkelpearl. But, you know, I think the design question really is about, to me, the functionality, meaning what we can achieve in a site. What I love that these architects did is they thought about with the community, not just the narrow question of affordable housing, but how to do even more. How to get the pre-K in, how to get the cultural space in, and really maximize. This is, you know, when you have a chance to build something from scratch like this, you should try to do the most with the most lasting impact. So I think we are looking in many cases, affordable housing is our first love, everyone knows it. But there's going to be places where a pre-K center or a school or obviously some public space or a cultural amenity can also be included, and that's uh, ideal when we can double up like that. On topic, yes. The uh, affordable units that were started under the prior administration that are coming online now, just, just for those, I guess, keeping score at home, are, are you counting those toward your initiative? Because I know some of them were actually counted by the former the former administration, I think, and you know, I've said that their, their plan was very substantial and I think it achieved a lot for the city. I have some differences with the way it was constructed and we have made changes that we believed in, like the income mix and other factors. Um, and we're doing more larger units for larger families, et cetera. But I think the bottom line is our view is where we have added value, we're going to count it towards our number. And basically, when you, if you look, I've been educated by Vicki and by Alicia Glenn, none of these things are done until they're done. So I don't think they actually counted units that were not fully complete. I think they were pretty consistent about that. They may have projected, but I don't think they counted uh, completed units unless they were. We received a lot of stuff in motion, but a lot of work had to be done to bring it to fruition. That's why we count it in our number. If every site is different, again, Vicki will jump in any time to add, and don't be shy. Every site is different, so we're going to look for every appropriate, you know, in some cases it is, in some cases a site would only be housing, but Vicki can speak to that. Yeah, I, I mean, we're, we're very much looking to bring to the community what the community needs and to work with the community to, to see what it is that it needs. So in some neighborhoods that will mean mixed use, in some neighborhoods that will mean, you know, job creation op opportunities, in some neighborhoods it's retail, in some neighborhoods it's cultural. It really depends upon the neighborhood. And I think one of the real tenets of the mayor's plan is that we're going to be working with the neighborhoods to provide housing that not just provides units, but helps to develop a more thriving neighborhood. Okay, on topic, last call, on topic, on topic, going once. Oh, we got one, go. Can you discuss what specifically your administration added to this project? Because it was already under construction when you took Vicki, come on over and tell them what, what it takes to, over the last five months, what we've been doing with this project. So, for example, um, we are still working to, uh, to close the, the documents and everything on the last $3 million piece. 
Um, it's, and that's been um, actually uh, quite a, uh, a feat because we have to show um, for, for projects like this where there's multiple uses, it gets to be, the financing gets to be extremely complicated. And so, for example, our finance teams are working very hard with Ellen and her teams to put those last financing pieces into place. In other words, nothing is free in this life. I think I saw one other hand. Did I see another hand on topic? OK, going once, going twice. We're off topic. Uh, on Friday, there was a debate between uh, Congressman Rangel, the Reverend, and uh, the state senator. And the congressman turned some heads by um, saying that the only thing that the state senator had done was being born Dominican. I was wondering if there has been some criticism of that comment and if you share any kind of concern that it's racially divided. I did not see the debate, and I haven't seen the whole tape, and I want to be very careful that I would not uh, comment on something unless I fully understood what was said. That being said, I have certainly uh, held as a standard here that for all the candidates to talk about the issues, talk about the substance, and you know, there's no place in this discussion for questions of race or nationality. This is a crucially important uh, congressional district in this city. Uh, the decisions should be made by the voters on the basis of substance. I certainly have heard from Congressman Rangel uh, that he is very mindful of uh, being cautious with word choice going forward, and I respect that. Uh, but I would say to all the candidates involved, let's get back to the issues. I don't think the people will smile on any discussion of anything but the issues. Don't, I have not seen the bill. So again, we'll get you an answer, but I have not seen the bill, so I can't comment. Um, yesterday was the uh, first time that the National Puerto Rican Parade uh, was held under a new leadership. Yes. Um, and, you know, after a string of controversies, what is your assessment of uh, the way it was performed yesterday? Oh, it was amazing. I, I had a, I've been to a lot of Puerto Rican Day parades. This was a beautiful uh, day in every way. I thought it was very well organized. I thought the energy in the crowd was fantastic. So uh, I give everyone who was part of bringing together a new leadership and a new approach credit. Speaker Melissa Marfivorito was deeply involved. I think she did an extraordinary job. They only had a few months to get this right. And you can see by the final product, uh, really a rebirth of the parade, and I thought it was really as good as it could possibly have been. Uh, no, let's go. Someone hasn't gone yet. Rich? Mr. Mayor, after, I don't know, two and a half, three years and about $150 million, City Hall, uh, City Hall being fixed up, now scaffolding has gone back up again. Can you, can you tell us what's going on there? What the, did, did the first job not work? Or? Rich, as soon as I understand what the heck is going on, you will be the first to know. Uh, I have not gotten into the intricacies of uh, why the scaffolding is up. Obviously, none of us love it, but it's uh, work that's being done on a very old building that needs serious work. But I would be happy, I'm turning to the estimable Phil Walzak, I would be happy to get both you and I a clear and specific explanation of what is happening with that scaffolding. Someone told me it was like modern art. You know, it's, it's a... It's kind of one of those Bloomberg installations, and it just was done late, you know? <laughs> Louder? No. Um, from the best of my understanding, we've described it in great detail, and I think it has been published uh, in other sites. So I'll find out, because I'm not an expert in the intricacies of legalities when it comes to labor relations, I'll find out, and Phil will follow up on what we are legally allowed to, uh, to publish. But I think uh, the details have gone out publicly in different ways. Mr. Mayor, why have you decided not to endorse in that race, and does that uh, suggest to New Yorkers that you're unsure whether or not the congressman deserves re-election? 
I uh, know the three leading candidates very well. I've worked with all of them, and I think there's times, especially in the context of a Democratic primary, where you say it's not a uh, particularly appropriate place to get involved for a variety of reasons. Um, so I had to make a baseline decision. Did I think I should be involved? I came to the conclusion I should not be. And we'll obviously know in two weeks who the Democratic nominee is, and at that time I'll support the Democratic nominee. Oh, okay, thank you, everyone.